Praise Jesus, who is our chief cornerstone, the one on whom our faith rests. Well, this morning we are going to be starting a new message series where we're looking at some things that Jesus has to say about our relationships with other people. We're calling this series Jesus on Homes. Anybody seen the TV show Homes on Homes? We have a few fans. Yes, gotcha. So you know what we're talking about here. It's uh, so that's a simple TV show uh, where a guy whose name is Holmes comes in and he looks at houses that have been built or have been remodeled, but, but they're kind of messed up. They didn't follow the right protocol. They didn't follow codes or whatever. And so he comes in and he, and he kind of tears out the problems and he fixes them up right. And, you know, in our relationships with others, sometimes we get things a little bit messed up. And so we're going to look at some things that Jesus says or that Jesus does uh, that, that help us understand a little bit more about our relationships with others. Now, this morning, we're going to be talking um, about relationships with children. Certainly, that's something that is very, very important here at Stillwater Church. And, of course, we get that value from Jesus. It was very, very important to him as well. But if you've spent any length of time around kids, you know that raising kids is not a simple thing. It's not at all easy. Doing children's ministry, it's not at all easy. But in case there's any skeptics of that, we've got a quick video clip to help illustrate. <laughs> Maybe you've uh, been there before. Maybe you didn't have 12 kids, but that's certainly a lot of work, is it not? Raising kids is not easy. Any parent, grandparent, etc., has uh, their stories uh, of difficult times with kids. I won't bore you with a million of mine, but I remember one of my first experiences of just this is hard, uh, was when we had our, our firstborn, Jacob, and he was, about, he was about toddler age. He was beginning to walk, which is where all the fun really begins, right? And so he loved, when we go into a store, he loved to walk on his own, didn't want to ride in the cart anymore. So he and I had a deal that he could walk on his own as long as he was walking in the directions that I wanted him to walk, right? If not, then he'd have to ride in the cart because I wasn't going to follow him around the store all day. And so we were doing this one day, and he decided he wanted to go his own direction. It was probably more towards the candy aisle than the direction I was heading. And I said, no, we can't do that. We're going to go this way. And he didn't like that and refused. And so I simply picked him up, put him in the cart, and that did not go over well. <laughs> Jacob is, generally speaking, a very uh, happy, friendly, whatever person. But in these moments, this just really rubbed him the wrong way. And he decided he's not riding in the cart. He doesn't want to do that. So he starts throwing just the biggest fit you can imagine, and he's punching, and he's kicking, and he's trying to push himself out of the cart. So I put, like, one elbow on his shoulder, and I buckle down that, you know, that strap in there that they have, and uh, it makes him even more mad, and he's just top of the lungs screaming. And I'm only about halfway through the grocery list, and I'm task-oriented, right? So I'm not leaving at this point. So I continue going through the grocery store while he's screaming, which doesn't really bother me, but what I learned that day is it does tend to bother others, right? <laughs> and I got all the looks I got kind of fell into one of two categories. It was either folks um, who apparently didn't have kids or didn't understand yet the challenge of this because they'd give you those looks like, seriously, I'm trying to buy my milk here and your kid's screaming. Doesn't he have an off switch? Can't you just, you know, cut, you know, uh, of course that off switch is candy, right? But we're not doing candy this day, let me tell you. So, so that was one category. The other category was, was also a disapproving look, but it was the opposite kind of disapproving look. It was more of that, like, disapproving look of horror, right? Like, your kid is screaming, and you don't seem to care. What's wrong with you? Do you not have a heart or something like that? And you know those folks, because when you look at them, they kind of look the other way, right? They're a little bit embarrassed, but you know who they are, because, like, just as they walk past you, you hear them mutter things, like, Siri call Department of Children and Family Services, right? <laughs> you only got about eight minutes to get out of the store at that point. So regardless, he was throwing just the fit of all fits. And I realized at that point, man, this is just not easy. I mean, it's, it's just not a simple thing, raising kids. Of course, parents of teenagers will tell you that those are the easy days, right? Because <laughs> at least in those days, you can, like, strap them in the cart. And you can physically do that, and it's legal at that point. Um, Later on, you can't use those same tactics. Like, we were, I, I don't know because I don't have teenagers, but, but I was one, so I know from experience there that, that teenagers, man, we, we can be our own treats at times. Um, I was 16. I had just gotten my license, and I was running a little late for curfew one night, and so I was, we lived out in the country, and I was speeding, trying to hurry home to, to make up some time. And 
the, we, we state of Illinois there, you know, there's a lot of just flat areas and that kind of stuff. So it's coming up to a stop sign where you can see all four directions in a long way. So I'm, I'm hurrying, so I decide to sl I slow down considerably, and I just roll on through the stop sign, right? I think I rolled through at about 50 miles an hour, but that's beside the point. So there's a police officer that uh, I was not aware of sitting with his lights off up in a driveway who then proceeds to pull out and issue me my first ticket ever. And I knew I, so then I got home. Of course, my mom and dad were in bed, which made me even more frustrated because they wouldn't have even known, right? So I got this ticket for nothing. But the next day, I remember I had to tell them. And I remember my mom saying, well, that was a pretty stupid thing to do, wasn't it? But you're 16, and I can't stop you from being stupid. You're going to have to decide <laughs> if you want to continue to do this stuff. But if you do, the state of Illinois will take away your driver's license, and then what will happen next is you will have to hire me to be your taxi, and I am not cheap. <laughs> that helped. It worked, actually. I <laughs> that was pretty motivating to me as a 16-year-old guy. So it's not easy. It is just not easy raising kids, but it is just one of the most important things that we do. It's one of the most important responsibilities we have a ch as a church to, to pass the good news of Jesus Christ on to the next generation. Stillwater is a place that's valued this for a long time. I mean, for crying out loud, we've got a playground in the other end of the building, right? Clearly, it's a value around here. We want our teens, we want our children to come to know Jesus. And we get that value from Jesus Christ. Uh, look at what he said here. We're going to be in Luke chapter 18 today. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn there or you can look up on the screen. And look at how Jesus interacts with children. It says this, One day some parents brought their little children to Jesus uh, to uh, bless, so that he could uh, touch them and bless them. But the disciples told them not to bother him. Okay, so parents are bringing their kids. In fact, the original language, it actually re refers to babies. So these are, we're talking like babies and toddler age kids, okay? And they, they bring them to Jesus so that he can touch them, that he can bless them. But the disciples, they don't like this. And they say, hey, hey, quit bothering Jesus, right? Why don't you leave Jesus alone here? And the disciples, remember, this was a common thing. Uh, Jesus was a teacher, also known as a rabbi in those days. And rabbis had followers. They had disciples who would go along with them, and would, they would learn from the rabbi. That was kind of how they did college. This was like an internship, if you will. And they would learn from him. They would help him out. Uh, they would take care of details for him. And so the disciples think that they're helping Jesus out here. They're going to kind of be Jesus' little bouncers here, saying, hey, we don't need these babies around. We don't need these little kids around. Because in those days, kids were to be seen and, and not heard. Kids did not have high standing in society in those days. And so the disciples said, Jesus, he doesn't need to be bothered with this stuff. I mean, parents, don't you understand? Jesus is the one, like, he, he walks on water, right? He, he heals the sick. He casts out demons. Uh, one time Jesus took a little boy's lunch and he fed 5,000 people. Jesus is a big-time rabbi here. He's not your little, like, baby kissing, kid patting kind of rabbi. That's like, yeah, that's another rabbi. That's like Rabbi Randy over there, right? What's that guy do anyway? He doesn't heal anybody. He probably can't even make like boxed macaroni. You can send your kids to him any day. He's got time. But Jesus, he's big time. He doesn't have time for your kids. He doesn't have time to mess with this stuff. But that's not what Jesus thinks. He even, he probably embarrasses his disciples a little bit because he's going to correct them right in front of them, everybody. Verse 16, then Jesus called for the children and said to his disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. The kingdom of heaven, this thing that we're building here, this belongs to children. So it's not a matter of not having time. The kingdom is theirs. How in the world can, can you push them away? How in the world can you stop them? Jesus is taking the normal social order, and he's turning it on his, its head. He's taking the normal so, social order, which says children don't really matter until they get older. And he says, no, the kingdom of heaven belongs su to such as these. But then he takes it a whole nother level. I assure you, anyone who does not have their kind of faith will never get into the kingdom of God. Wow. Not only does he say they're welcome and the kingdom belongs to them, but in fact, adults, 
Look at these little ones. That's the kind of faith that you want to have. That's your model of faith. <laughs> Disciples, they're sitting here, wait a minute. Well, I thought we were the models of faith, right? I'm Simon Peter. I should be the model of faith. <laughs> no. Jesus says, these little ones, these children, they're the model, they're the example of what faith should really look like. Jesus, he takes this to a whole nother level. In another verse, Mark chapter 9, verse 42, where he says this, If anyone causes one of these little ones who trust in me to lose faith, it would be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. Huh. What do you really think about that, Jesus, right? I mean, he says, if you get in the way, you know, uh, of a kid's faith, if you cause one of these little ones who trust in me to lose faith, it would be better for that person to be thrown into the sea with a large millstone tied around his neck. This is unusual language for us. Uh, millstones were common in those days because, remember, it was a farming society, and so we, they would need to grind grain and that type of stuff. So there were a couple versions of this. They had their smaller millstones like the, the, that servants or farmers would use, and, and they would use these, and they'd kind of kind of round rocks. They would roll out those grains. Um, but, but if you really wanted to do a bigger production, you would use a larger millstone like referred to here. And what the original language literally says, it doesn't say large millstone, it says a donkey-driven millstone, okay? So this is a modern version of that. And it's real simple. You've got a, a big stone that they would uh, shave off the edges and make it circular. Uh, they would bore out the middle of it and, uh, and so that that way a donkey could be attached. And his job is to go round and round all day long. Somebody throws the grain on there, it gets ground down, and then they, they wipe it off, throw more grain on there, and the donkey just keeps doing circles. I don't know if donkeys get dizzy or not, but I would think they would. Of course, we do this in modern day, right? Except instead of a millstone, we just set our kids on them, right? And go round and round at the fair all day long. So this is like the ancient version of that. And so Jesus is saying, hey, if, if you are, if anybody is going to cause one of these little ones who trusts in me to lose faith, it would be better to tie one of those stones around their neck and toss them into the ocean. It's, it's a ridiculous illustration. But he's saying nothing, nothing should ever come in between these kids and me. Nothing. Uh, that the person's life is not worth having if they're getting in the way of that. So Jesus is using some hyperbole here, but he's helping us to understand just how important this is. And from Jesus we learn, if you're taking notes, that as a church, we have a shared responsibility with parents to help ge develop the next generation of Jesus followers. As a church, we have a shared responsibility with parents to help develop the next generation of Jesus followers. If not us, then who will? This is our responsibility, something God has called us to. Today we celebrate Katie's baptism, and we celebrate this covenant that we have together with Katie, with Pam and Tom, with her family, to help her come to know Jesus more and more and more as she grows. See, Katie gives all that she understands of herself to all of Jesus that she understands right now. That's really all that any of us ever do, right? But as Katie grows in faith, Stillwater, we've got to be there for her to help her grow in her faith. So that when she looks at me, when she looks at you, when she looks at our children's ministries, when she later attends our youth ministries, all these kinds of things, that she sees Jesus through us. That's an incredible charge, an incredible responsibility. You know, it's been said that it takes a village to raise a child. And we would say it takes a church. It takes a church. As parents, we have responsibilities, but as a church, we have our own responsibility. And we're blessed to be at a church that gets to baptize kids on a regular basis. In fact, last weekend, we got pictures here. We baptized three children uh, at the Y. It was at our consecration dinner. We can just kind of cycle through those. In fact, there's Katie's mom, Pam, our uh, children's ministry leader, who is uh, helping right there. That is my son, what a privilege as a pastor to get to baptize your own kid, right? Uh, but we are so thankful to get to baptize children here because it reminds us that God is at work here in us that God is at work through our ministries, drawing children to himself, and we have a constant responsibility to continue to, to be a good model of what Jesus looks like, to continue to have great ministries that impact kids' lives. Now, when we baptized Katie today, I asked you a couple simple questions. 
and it's still water, we, we kind of take the traditional language and we, we put it more in terms that we usually use. That's, that's kind of just our preferred way of doing it. But the, the original one you see today, the original United Methodist language that we would use, we put it up here on the screen, is this. This would be our vow. This is kind of what I tend to summarize. And I want you actually to read this here with me, okay? This is what we would do if we were in a normal kind of like hymnal using type church, okay? Read this with me. With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that child, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Okay? That would be the vow. You see, it's a little different language than we use, but you see what it says. It's such powerful language. With God's help, can't do this on our own. We will so order our lives after the example of Christ. That's a strong statement. That doesn't mean, you know, we don't just say, when it's convenient for us, we'll try to be a good example for kids. We'll, we'll do our best, right? No, that's not what it says. It doesn't say, if, if I feel like it, if I'm up to it, if your kid's not irritating me today, I'll try to be an example for Jesus. No, it doesn't say, if I have time, maybe sometime, I might consider helping in children's ministry. No, it says, we will order our lives after the example of Christ. Order our lives. Rearrange our stuff so that we can be a good example for kids of what Jesus Christ looks like, so that Katie or others can be surrounded by our steadfast love, may be established in the faith, confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. This is such a big deal, because when we do this, we are, we are strengthening our children and our youth in, in the way that helps them to find Jesus and to find eternal life. Did you know that statistically, 80% of people who make decisions for Jesus Christ do so by the age of 18 or before. 80%. If you, if you accepted Jesus older than that, you, you beat the odds. Congratulations. You're in that, that 20% group. Most of us make these kinds of decisions early on in life. And it's such an important responsibility that we have as a church. Because in these formative years, to help kids know Jesus and help kids have the freedom to make that choice for themselves. See, baptism, friends, it's, it's not an end. If you're taking notes, it's not an end. It's a beginning. When we celebrate a child's baptism or a teen's baptism, we're celebrating the work that God has done, but more so, we're celebrating the work that God will be doing in their lives. And we're covenanting, or we're making a covenant together to, to affirm that and to help to support that. That's something that, that we do. And and you know, the thing is, I fully understand that not everybody is called to, to be in children's ministry. That's okay. If you really dislike kids, we really don't want you to work in the nursery, right? <laughs> it's okay. But there are a variety of ways that we can each do this. Of course, we all can pray. That's, that's obvious, and that's so important. That's the most important thing we can do. Um, we can all just set a good example. Because when kids come here and they see you, they see people who are followers of Jesus, and they are taking their cues from you, from me, the way that we treat each other, the, the way that we love one another, the way that we talk, the way that we act. They're, they're taking their cues from us as to what it means to follow Jesus Christ. Sometimes we kind of shy away from this stuff because we're scared. We're scared maybe that kids will have questions and we won't know the answers. Well, don't worry about that stuff, right? I mean, if a kid asks you some theological question that you don't have the answer to, use my favorite answer. I don't know. It's a fair answer, right? But I'll help you find the answer. And then you can come talk to me. You can talk to somebody in our children's ministry. We will help you with that. Um, you don't need to be afraid of that. Sometimes we're afraid uh, of uh, really that our kids will, I don't know, that they'll get us into areas that we're not comfortable with. Maybe some of our own doubts or our own struggles. That's one of the best things about raising kids is that they really make you look at your own faith in a more serious way. Those areas that you may have said, eh, I'm just not going to think about that. I'm not going to ask those questions. They ask the question, and they cause us to grow in our faith, that when we reach out to our kids and we love on our kids, we oftentimes find that it's our own faith who grows or that grows. Sometimes we're concerned because we look back at our lives, especially maybe teenage years or something, and we say, Man, I messed up so many things. Who am I? 
who am I to be teaching these kids anything because I didn't do it perfectly? Well, who did? I mean, the only one in that, with that argument, the only one qualified to raise kids would be Jesus, and he didn't have any biological kids, so that kind of was eliminated from that equation. So he's trusting us with this. Yeah, us. Flawed, imperfect people. But it's okay. And, and if, if, if you had struggles in your life before that God has brought you through, awesome. Praise God. Let, let those examples help you as, as you raise your kids. Your kids are not looking for, for somebody who acts like they're perfect. They're looking for somebody who's real, who's really wrestled with this stuff, and yet has come out saying, I trust in Jesus. I believe in Jesus because he's never let me down. He's never let me go. He's walked with me through all the hard times. Even when I was running the other direction from him, his grace was right there for me. And that's a powerful example for, for a child or, or for a teenager. You see, the church is here to support parents. That's a big part of our job. But we can never, ever replace you, parents. We can never replace you, grandparents. We, we have your kids for a pretty small percentage of the week. And, and you have an influence on them that is so important. Let us help. Let us partner with you. Let us know how we can help you better in those areas. But don't ever think that you can just outsource your kids' spiritual care to the church. Because, friends, your kids will always come up spiritually hungry because they're always going to be lacking something from you. We cannot replace that component. You, your faith, your faith's impact on your kids is so significant. It, it's so important. Parents, we put emphasis on so many things. I mean, just, just look at sports, right? And I love sports personally. My kids are involved in sports. I grew up in sports. I think they're great. But, but look at the, in, the, the uh, impact that we, or the influence that we have with sports. We, we sign our kids up for all this stuff. We spend lots of money on it. We'll travel to all kinds of crazy places. We'll spend our whole weekends attending their games and that kind of stuff. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. But, but I would ask you, what, ki what kind of significance do you put on your kids' spiritual development? You put a lot on their athletic development or on their academic development, also very important. Or, or on their development as a human being, right? Do you let your kids leave the house without brushing their teeth in the morning? Hopefully not. That's an important thing, right? Well, why would you let them leave the house without praying for them first? I mean, it's, it's just simple stuff. It's significant stuff, and it makes an impact on your kids' lives. If we take our kids' spiritual development as seriously as we take their other development, they'll be growing in their faith for sure. Because we don't slack in any of those other areas. Parents, let us not slack in this most important area as well. And finally, look back to Jesus' words again. Let the children come to me. Don't stop them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. I assure you, anyone who doesn't have their kind of faith will never get into the kingdom of God. Let me ask you, well, how does your faith stand up to that? We get this adult version of faith that is oftentimes so different than a childlike faith. A childlike faith comes to Jesus as we are. Adults, we try to kind of put on, on these masks and, and, and pretend we're somebody we're not. Children, they just come to Jesus as they are because he accepts you. He doesn't want you wearing the mask. He wants you being you. He loves you. He forgives you. Children, they assume that Jesus can forgive them of their sins because they know what their sins are. They, they haven't gotten old enough to get into all this denial goofiness that we get into. Why can't we do the same? Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner and I need you in my life. And children, they're not afraid to wrestle with their questions. Why can't we do the same? Jesus invites us to do that, in fact. Let us as a church help. If there's something that you're wrestling with, you need help with, let me know. Let's talk. Let's, let's see what God can do in your life. And friends, if you're sitting here and you realize, I don't have that kind of faith. I've never really given myself to Jesus Christ. I, I'm here and I'm, I'm hypothetically involved in church or whatever, but, but I've never really said, Jesus, I, just, I need you. I love you. I want to follow you. I want you to be in my life. I want you to be in my heart. I want you to be my best friend forever, Jesus, so I can follow you. If you're realizing you've never made that decision, well, let us know this morning. 
you can pray and you can ask Jesus into your life this day. You take your connection card out and you can check that box. It says, I want to be a follower of Jesus. And we'll follow up with you and we'll talk with you more about that. Because what an important decision. It's the most important decision that you can ever make, friends. A couple ways you can act this out this morning. First, pick one way. You might even write it down now. What's one way that you can help a child grow in faith this week? Maybe you as parents are sitting and you're thinking of some ideas. Here's a way that I could help my children grow in faith. I can pray with them daily. I can uh, read scripture with them. I can uh, commit to bringing them to church, to Sunday school. I can, you fill in the blank. Maybe others of you, you're saying, you know what? I need to get involved in children's ministry. We've got a great one here, but we still could use more folks involved in that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step over that line and I'm going to do that. I'm going to have a, an impact there. Uh, maybe other ways that you can do that. Second way, here's an easy thing that you can act out this week, um, is you can make an Operation Christmas Child box. Operation Christmas Child is a simple way that we share Jesus' love with kids we'll never meet. We've got a quick video clip about that, in fact. (laughs) To some, it may just be a shoebox. But to millions, it is the start of the greatest journey. Traveling the world, sent with prayer. More than eight and a half million shoebox gifts fill the hearts of children from over 100 different countries with hope, faith, and love. This is the story of Operation Christmas Child. There you go. You know, we're in India right now in Hyderabad, and these kids, they've never had a gift like this. And when we can give a gift and do it in the name of Jesus Christ, it means everything in the world. Isn't that cool? We can give a gift, do it in the name of Jesus, it means everything in the world. You can go home, uh, there's instructions in your bulletin, you can get a shoebox, you can pack this thing, bring it back here next week, and, and you can impact a life for Jesus Christ. You'll never know the full significance of that box, but kids come to know Jesus every year because of this awesome ministry that we get to be a part of. So that's another simple way you can live this out. Let's pray. God, would you use us, Stillwater Church, to make a difference in your kingdom? Lord, would you use us to reach out to children, to teens, help them to come to know Jesus through us? God, would you use us as individuals to be excellent examples for you? Lord, we're far from perfect, but God, we want to model you to the best of our abilities. Lord, would you use these gifts uh, that we send around the world with Operation Christmas Child, would you use them and bless them to impact children's lives for you? Lord, we thank you for this incredible responsibility and opportunity that you give us, God. We love you so much and pray this in your holy name. Amen.